Hi, everybody. I'm Dave Sims, Seattle Mariners broadcaster, and this is Baseball and Black America. And as you know, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, a young black man by the name of Jacob Blake shot seven times in the back at close range. The last word we had, he was paralyzed and going through multiple surgeries. Just 89 days prior, George Floyd was murdered in Minnesota. And we have convened some African-American players, largely from the Seattle Mariners, which our ball club has the most in Major League Baseball. Let me introduce them to you. We're going to have a conversation about the decision to not play uh, in Wednesday's game at San Diego, joining with the, in uh, cohesion with the NBA and the WNBA. Seattle Mariners, we got a good crew here. We got D. Gordon. Shed Long, Tywin Walker, J.P. Crawford, Justin Dunn, Kyle Lewis, Justice Sheffield, and from the uh, Milwaukee Brewers, Devin Williams. And uh, Dee, let me start with you as a senior member of the group. The what was it like? I, I, we saw the feed from the ballpark in, at Petco. The leadership council for our ball club and the San Diego ball club got together and discussed things. How did that go? And, and was it easy to get to the decision to boycott? Uh, for uh, to not play in Wednesday's game? Uh, the decision had already been made on our part uh, as an organization, as a team. And we were just informing them what we were going to do, uh, just to be plain and simple about it. Wow. Okay. Guys, let me get your reactions. I mean, I, it, it, it's obvious. I mean, the man, he was there to break up a fight, gets involved with the police. They shoot him in the back. Your reaction, I mean, here we, it, like I think I said when you guys all came on here, here we go again. I mean, what's it going to take? What's it going to take? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's, it's crazy. Anybody, anybody, jump in. I mean, it, it, what, what's your level of anger? I mean, it's the same anger. Is it more anger from, is it, is it a different kind of anger or is it more explosive kind of anger since the Floyd killing in late May? I mean, for me, it's like, stop. It's just like, stop. You know, we have a kid uh, drive up from Illinois and kill two people. Right. Yeah, just last night. Uh, how? If that was a young black kid walking around with AR-15, his head would have got chopped off. No question. Like, but people see us as the problem. Yeah. Not talking about, I'm talking about athletes. We're the problem for speaking up for our people because it's easy just to point a finger instead of, you know, seeing the real things that's going on. It's making a lot of people realize a lot of their views were, were messed up you know, how they were raised or messed up. And that's not our fault. We were messed up. We were raised with tra trauma as well. We learned how to survive being black. We just got done talking about this a couple months ago. Correct. The uh, Dr. Harry Edwards, who organized the Olympic uh, boycott back in 68, uh, what he said, he said, this is not a, talking about, I guess the Milwaukee Bucks were the first one to get the ball rolling. This is not a boycott against basketball any more than Kaepernick was taking a knee against the flag. That was simply the vehicle to send this message. Stop killing us. Says it all. I mean, how do you guys feel like when you, when you walk out? And I think we might have talked about this before. You leave the ballpark and, you know, you're driving back to your home, your apartment or whatever, or walking, hey, just maybe shopping in the, you know, when you're on the road. I mean, are you like, like DEFCON 5? I mean, you're on, on alert all the time. How's that work? Always on guard. You're always on guard. You never know where it's coming from. You never know where some could hit you from. So you're always mm -hmm. on guard. You're always checking your surroundings. You know, who you going to hang out with, you got to make sure you know who's in that group. You got to right. know who's around at all times. And that's just, I think that's just the nature of it at this point. And know uh, they're down if anything happens. Yeah, yeah. I, I always look at it like like when I was playing football and you go down a kick coverage, your head's got to be in a 360 swivel. How, how's it, 
as baseball players, uh, Devin, let me ask you this. How many, how many black players do you have on, on the Brewers block club? Are you, are you the only one? Uh, yeah, currently I'm the only one since Low came and opted out. Yeah. Wow. So, wow, what's that like being the only black player on a major league team in the year 2020? I mean, it's it's tough, man. Like, you know what I mean? You don't have really anyone to relate to, but – or it's tough to relate to people because they don't come from the same place that you come from or have the same experiences that you have or even, like, understand what you're talking about when you tell them, like, these things, you know what I mean? But, uh, I mean, we, we have a good group of guys, and it wasn't even my idea to uh, – shut the game down today that was brought to me by some of our other players so we got a good support system over here i saw uh ryan braun i saw the uh, great counsel your skipper i thought they they spoke very well of the whole situation i was watching mlb uh, network on tv and uh, they sounded super supportive which you know that's got to make you feel you know it, it enhances your, your comfort level a little bit. I mean, you don't yeah, have to. definitely. I mean, they've been doing a lot to make me comfortable. And, like, I mean, council realizes the climate that we're in right now and, like, the things that, like, black people go through on a daily basis. He's been a huge voice for us, and I appreciate that a lot. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he's just been supporting me. And, like, I told him the other day that I was going to put BLM on the mound, and he said, go for it, man. Do what you got to do. Just express yourself in the best way you can. And being that it happened so close to Milwaukee, I mean, obviously that that has a, and that that's a that's a thud right to your heart right there for you guys, right? I mean, we're forty miles away. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a thirty minute drive from here, so that one hit me pretty hard. Uh, I mean, George Floyd, like that one upset me, but this Jacob Blake one two days ago just kind of just made me angry more than anything just this, it's the same thing over and over again like you know it happens we have the conversation we need to fix it and then three months later here we are again having the same conversation hey p what's it been like in a mariner ball club i mean what the discussion you know as, as devin talked about coming off uh a floyd murder i was wondering if, was there, was there a different level of conversations or, you know, with, with the rest of the guys in the team, not just, you know, with the black players, but the other players, white players? Um, yeah, we had a, we had a team meeting. No, that was about it. But, you know, everyone knows what's going on. And at this point, like, if you don't get what's going on, you don't want it. You don't want to get it. You're part of the problem. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to get what's going on with us, what we go through. So, that's what I got. I'm just fed up. I saw your tweet earlier. How can you not be fed up? I mean, it's justice. What, what, you know, what, what, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah. Um, I mean, definitely anger um, because, you know, we, we just went through it. We just, we just discussed it. You know, we, we have these t-shirts that, that come out and we're wearing these t-shirts and it's, you know, brought to, you know, everybody's wearing it around different leagues and uh, different organizations. And, you know, for it to happen again, it's like, what else do we have to do? You know, so in my head, it was a no brainer uh, today. And, and, you know, um, I'm happy for, you know, the rest of the guys um, in our locker room to, you know, have our back and, you know, agree with us. Yeah, I, you guys have the benefit of having – we have nine or ten uh, black players now. I mean, mm -hmm. you have – like, uh, Justin, you got the built-in support system, which is different from uh, – of a different kind of support system with, with more familiar faces uh, in, in your clubhouse than maybe what Devin is going through right now. Yeah, that, that made me feel good to know that Devin had, had that type of support behind him. Uh, mm -hmm. made, it also makes me feel good, you know, knowing Christian Yellich is one of my close friends and knowing that he had his back. That makes me feel good. That, that puts me in a good spot. Uh, but got a lot of work to do, man, as you can see. Um, and, and that's interesting to say, Justin, what about, you know, a lot of work to do? What kind of stuff 
if, if you had to make a recommendation or if you wanted to throw something on the table for discussion, what, what, what would it be? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't necessarily know what needs to be done. I think for me, first and foremost, is we post these pictures and, and you get the positive replies. We get people who say you have your back, but you still get these negative comments about people saying we're supporting a Marxist movement. If you can't understand we're not supporting a Marxist movement, then you really are blind to what's going on. This is just simple equality of our lives matter just as much as yours. And, and we take the brunt of a lot of problems. So for y'all to continuously say that we are supporting a Marxist movement that no one who's ever posted anything about Black Lives Matter has ever claimed to represent, have the backing of, then that needs to be probably taken care of first and foremost to, to understand what we are truly saying when we say Black Lives Matter. And it's simply Black Lives Matter. We're not with that movement in any, any way, shape, or form. We just want to be treated like everybody else, be treated equally, be able to walk out of our house and not have to live in fear. Plain and simple. Yeah. Jed, what about you? Jed, what about, what about, what about? Oh, um, I mean, I think, I think, you know, something to fix the problem would be, you know, going into these police stations and, and getting rid of, you know, the clicks that's in these police stations, you know, because then most of the police stations, you know, is, is, is racist clicks, you know, so we, we need to get rid of that because, um, I mean, what happened in that video, like, there's there's more to it, you know, I mean, to, to shoot someone seven times like that, like, there's, that's hating your heart, you know, against a, another man's kind, you know, so, you know, we got to go in there and get rid of those racist cliques and, you know, just, they got to have some better training to, to do better with us, you know, but, I mean, at the same time, we got to be better as people, not even just, you know, um, police officers who are supposed to protect or the athletes, like, just people in general, we got to be better, you know, as a whole to each other, you know, I mean, it's it's ridiculous, like, I just, I mean, I don't, I don't understand how you just do something like that, like, it's just, I don't know. Yeah, it's bad. Taiwan, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, it's. I think it's, you know, all the African-American players and people, you know, we continue to speak up and talk about it. But it's, it's going to take more than just us. It's going to take the non-African-American people and players all over the world, um, not even just the country, just all over the world, to continue to speak up and speak up for us. Um, and bring change and and to have these conversations that that do need to be had, you know, even though they're uncomfortable. And it's it's conversations that aren't just things that are conversations that just happen one time. You know, it, it needs to continue to happen, um, and not just with you know your kids. It has to be you know aunts, uncles, grandparents. You know, it has to be everyone. And you know, we have to continue to 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 learn and and, and teach each other, and really put put out the effort and not just speak the words we really have to put out the effort and I you know I'm really proud of of our team today our you know all our coaches players front office and everyone today you know we've been we we've been speaking it and you know today we we showed action and that's what really needs to happen uh, moving forward oh indeed indeed um what kind of reaction have you heard from your peer group like Kalu like have you heard from other friends in baseball or maybe in any other sports or, or just guys, you know, cats from back home? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, positive reactions from people that, you know, I know personally, I think they, you know, reach out to show support, you know, in whatever way they can. But, you know, at this point, it's, you know, it's good to get the, you know, text of support. But, you know, we kind of, we kind of looking for a little bit more now. You know, we're looking for something tangible, something we can look at, you know, as progress. I definitely do appreciate though people reaching out and uh, showing their support though. D, without giving away too many, you know, inside secrets, what what was the the team meeting like? Man, it was it was considering some of the stuff I've heard from other organizations. It's a breath of fresh air, man, to know that I have a have a team behind us and the teammates that we have is a no brainer for them. Uh, you know. We didn't go in with these intentions, but we did need to make a stance. And they made our teammates, our coaching staff, our organization made it easy for us. 
that, that's got to give you a tremendous sense of comfort in, you know, going to the ballpark every day, right, JP, knowing that, you know, these guys, you know, they got your back. I mean, it seems like as these things continue to happen, I mean, you, you guys, I think the last time we got together, you talked about the support was really strong, but it sounds like it's gone up another level or two. JP, oh, yeah, JP. definitely. Sorry. Definitely. Um, yeah, I was just guilt because we post all this stuff online and we do everything but you know we're not taking action i think today we proved a we proved a lot you know we made a statement and you know we just gotta continue moving forward to you know just keep making statements what about like from the players association as a whole you know all, everybody in, in the 30 teams has there been a statement or did you anticipate a statement coming out or, or some kind of initiatives or any of that kind of stuff, D, uh, that, that's maybe uh, on the horizon? Uh, honestly, right now, we don't know. This is so new. This all just happened. When we got to the ballpark, we, we spoke as men when we got there. Uh, and that's what happened. It, it was a split decision. We had, to, we had to do what we had to do to, you know, make that statement. Like JP said, when I watched, looked at JP eyes and he said, we need to take action. I mean, we needed to take action right then. And what, what's, um, Devin, what's the next step from here? I mean, uh, certainly you, you've garnered a lot of attention, you know, shutting things down, NBA, WNBA, you guys, only a handful of games, I guess, were played today. Um, and what, what's the next step in, in terms of, you know, getting more awareness. I, I like what Shed talked about. Hey, got a you know some kind of meeting of the minds with the police departments all over the place. But any you want to add to that, or if you have any other suggestions? Um, I, I just hope the rest of the league sees what's going on. You know, and just have our backs with everything that's going on. Devin, any it, if, any thoughts on that? I think the biggest thing is just to keep the conversation going. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot that people don't know. And I think people have been learning a lot throughout this whole process. And it's just needs to continue, you know, and build on that. And that will translate into the next generation and the next generation after that. Well, is there anything you would like to see or hear the commissioner slash MLB have a, having a say you know, that speaking its mind on, on this this issue again. Um, Anybody? Ty? Uh, I mean, I think just like everyone's been saying, you know, like we can we continue to have these conversations. Um, and if, you know, we if we need to revisit with the commissioner's office and see what more we can all do uh, to be better, to help to bring light to all these situations. Uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an emotional time right now. And um, I feel like the more that, you know, we can, the more support that we get from everyone else around the world and, you know, our country and stuff, uh, the more that change can happen. And, you know, it's not gonna happen overnight, but um, if it's slowly happening, um, then it, it's a big step in, in, in the right direction. Let's try this on for size. If you had an opportunity to speak to your local mayor, your governor, even the president himself, what kind of statement would you like, if you had a chance to go one-on-one -on -one or, or in a small group like this, the national political leaders, what would you say to them about trying to make this a better situation and turn the country in the, in the correct direction. Anybody want to jump on that? Um, I would just say, I would ask them, why aren't we doing more? Why aren't we holding the people accountable for their actions? You know, and it's, you know, people always talk about, you know, oh, black on black crime in Chicago, black African Americans kill more black African Americans. Well, those people who, who kill other people, they get, they get prosecuted right away. They get arrested and they get thrown in jail right away. But when a police officer kills someone, it's, oh, he gets paid leave, you know, and we have, to investigate it. we have to investigate it for for a month, two months. And then all of a sudden people forget about it. And then he's, he's off free doing it again. You know, it's, it's not like, how come he can't be arrested right away? 
and while he's arrested, you you go and and you investigate it while he's arrested behind bars, like everyone else. You know, I think that's I think that would be a big step in in, in change right there. All right. Want to add to that, D? Anybody yeah, I think I think you know, like Ty said about the black on black crime thing. I think that we we killed each other because we're trying to survive. We're trying to survive in a country where we've been getting killed for 400 years and it's okay. So we killed each other because we don't know how to thrive. If everyone was thriving, you listen to every guy on this Zoom call, we're thriving. So that means our family's thriving. Our family isn't trying to kill anybody or get ahead of anyone. No, they're not because they have us. You know what I'm saying? I think that the reason all of this happens is because we're, we are living in poverty. We are, we are. All of us have came from humble beginnings. And my dad played in 21 years in the majors and I still came from humble beginnings. And it, I would ask those leaders, do you really want this change or are you okay with this? Because if we start thriving, no, none of that will happen. There's no gang violence. There's no, no killing each other for a couple hundred dollars, a couple thousand dollars, because we're thriving as a people. When you oppress, you do oppress things. That is a survival mechanism. And that's just how I feel. Right. I mean, it's I mean, just the environment. Yeah, it's the environment that we built, you know. It's, right. it's, 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 you know, we, they, we're putting these environments in, in these situations to not succeed where other races are put in better situations than us. And like Dee said, it, you know, we, we, we try to survive and, you know, we do things we don't want to do to survive. But, you know, when we have families and stuff, people do stuff to, to take care of their families that they're not proud of and that they, want, that they don't want to do, but it's, it's part of our environment. All right. All right. We'll rise above it. So it's easier said than done for sure. Um, let me, let me I change a, a switch topics just a slight bit, just a slight turn here in terms of uh, in terms of your lot in baseball, having more black coaches, managers. Uh, I would, sorry, I wouldn't even say black coaches and managers. It, it's deeper than that. You know, it goes down to, uh, you know, black strength coaches, black mm -hmm. uh, uh, medical teams and, mm -hmm. and uh, front black, office and yeah. just, just more black people in baseball as, as a whole, as, as in general, instead of just coaches, you know, yes. there's more, there's more, more jobs and more opportunity in baseball than just to be a coach or, or a manager, you know, there's, there's yeah, so I'm much, PR, so many right? jobs. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Understood. yeah. It's way more than just the manager. Like, think about all these young black kids we have on the Mariners. You know, we got one black coach that can relate to them. You know, you see what I'm saying? Whereas in, we should have more, you know, we should have a black medical staff. You know, like, we, we're, we come from not the most easiest places to come from. All of us from somewhere different, but that don't mean we're going to all be able to be able to communicate with people who aren't our color. And, but we have to do that. You see what I'm saying? And that'll make us, that'll make our life easier for sure. So you're, and, you're looking for a little bit more for the environment to be a little bit more welcoming than, than what it, than it what might be at this point. And yeah, and like a black, you know, reflects what you look like and what you feel like. Right, right. Regardless, we want everybody to be the same. That's that's literally it. We not try. I'm not trying to get no head up on nobody. I and I'm pretty sure I speak for the group as well. Yeah, we just want to be equal. Like just just everybody the same. Boom, come get your work. Go be a good teammate. Go be a great player, and go home to your family. That's it. That that. I know it sounds simple, but we're making that so hard. Yeah. How it's so? Equal opportunity for everyone. Uh-huh. 
Ty, you want to jump on that? You said that D said it's they're making it so difficult for for you to just do that. You know, one, two, three. You know, home, work. You know, win games, playing games, travel, come home to your family. What what has made uh, it, from a black perspective? What what has been? What has made that? You know, well, that you, sounds like an ordinary situation. What makes it difficult? Just I mean, I think in the clubhouse. You know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of white players, a lot of um, Latin players, you know, and they have, they all have their cliques and where they come from and stuff. And, you know, in 2016, I was the only black player in the Mariners. I get traded. In 2017, I was the only black player on the Diamondbacks, you know. So I'm just sitting there in the middle, you know, just, you know, no one to really relate to. Um, and for myself, I, you know, it's it's tough because I speak, I speak differently you know, I, I don't feel comfortable the way I speak sometimes, you know, when I'm around other people than when I am around, you know, the D Gordon, D Gordon or Justice or Justin, you know, and to have more African-Americans in just in the, in baseball, you know, just coaches and everything around, like it makes it easier just to be yourself instead of trying to put on an act and act differently um, just to fit in, you know, that's what makes it tough. Well, you guys were in this situation, 2020, you guys have a good peer group, man. It's unbelievable. I mean, Devin, I, you, you hear this conversation, Devin, you must be going, damn, I want some of that, right? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I had, I think, four players last year, four other black players. That was the most I've ever played with. So I need to get back to that. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, that, you guys are doing a really good job using your, your platform. In terms of getting out of, into the communities, like if you if you have a chance or, or when you do get a chance to speak to maybe a youth group or something, what what kind of message are you, are you trying to send to those young kids? You know, whether it be you know little leaguers or maybe intermediate, you know, maybe high school players, that type of thing. For me, the biggest thing I'm taking out of this is letting these little black kids know that you can thrive in America. I know our parents have thrived. I mean, survived. Our grandparents have survived. You you can thrive. Don't don't fall victim to the stereotype because all of us have met the most athletic, best baseball, football, basketball player we ever seen is is still in our hometown because of opportunity. So go out there and do whatever it is you want to do and be whoever you want to be. How about let me let me throw this one at you. Uh, growing up in your respective communities, uh, and what were those experiences like in baseball that you know that you went through? I'd be curious to hear you know everybody a, a piece of everybody's backstory growing up, you know, back home and, and what that was like. Is because I'm going to guess you were the Lone Ranger in most of your places. You were <laughs> maybe one of a couple three black kids on a team. I mean, what was that experience like? Justice, I see you smiling there a little bit. What was it like for you in Tullahoma, Tennessee? Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, I played with very few uh, black kids coming up, little league, middle school, high school. Um, and I knew that I was different from the beginning. But uh, for me, I took on the, the leader role, I feel like, on every team that I was on just because I was able to – you know, play my style of game, my type of game, and, you know, kind of involve the other kids with that and try and be a leader in, 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 in that sense. Um, so that was that was one of those things where it was it – was, I was cool with it. You know, I had fun. I had great, great years in literally middle school and in high school, um, you know, but it was one of those things where I was very few, but I did have my brother, so that did help um, some of the times. So – uh, but, you know, just kind of taking that leader role and, and having fun with those boys and, and learning a little bit about them. And, you know, they learned a lot about me. And, you know, we just kind of meshed and, and went, went like that. Uh, what about uh, your experience down in Georgia? Man, I grew up – my high school team was all black with a black head coach. Wow. Black assistant coach, black principal. Black. Yeah, I, it's nice. <laughs> Listen, I'm talking. We might have had one white guy, and he didn't play a lot. So it was like we Good was all, you. and we had seven Division One players starting. So 
we had a blast. Like that was probably the best time of my life. That's awesome. It was the freedom, the ability to communicate with him when we mess up. He gonna talk to you like he know how to talk to you. You gonna it's easy to communicate with him. If we show up late to some, he don't got to tiptoe around the point of what he's trying to say. Like it's it's easy to to get like whatever you're trying to get out of that day. So, man, that uh, that really shaped me, like, being able to, to work with him. And I still work with my high school coach to this day just because it's so easy to communicate and, and, and uh, we kind of built that foundation. Wow. That's, That's awesome. A, That's a different experience. Chad, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what about your experience? And unmute yourself. You on mute. You on mute. <laughs> my dad. <laughs> so my dad was the black coach. I mean, like growing up, my dad was my coach pretty much the whole time. And so I mean, I had a black coach, but you know, in baseball, um, I didn't really have a lot of black teammates except like one year and like ten U. We had like an all black team with one white kid. Um, I mean, and we had a blast. We were supposed to go to the Little League World Series and um the game to go, we got cheated out of it. Uh we was in a we was in a racist place in Alabama and like they it was no way they was letting us win that game. Like they didn't even I was our best pitcher, they didn't want me to pitch, so they didn't allow it. They they made some kind of rules up, so like it didn't happen. So we wound up not going. So that was something that we experienced like and that was a big moment in my life that I experienced like racism like at the forefront, you yeah. know, as a as a young jit. Like it's like, wow, like really, like this is how it is. And and they're okay with this. You know, like that was, and I had that was the first time for me as a kid I had saw my dad cry. And like that was that was how bad it was, like that he cried about it. And I'm like, this is crazy, you know. But I mean, other than that, you know, uh, after that, the when I got into travel baseball, it was an all white team. I was the only black on the team, so like, you know, it was, I was, it was a lot of time spent with my parents, you know, uh, when we was on the road playing. You know, I got real close with my parents because it was at the field playing with them, and then it was back with my parents, and we'd do whatever in the cities we were in, you know. So I mean, but you just you learn to deal with it, I guess coming up where I come from. Man, oh man. JP, what about in SoCal? Um, thankfully, I never had to deal with like any racial issues like that to the extreme. But um, I was fortunate enough to, you know, have a very diverse group of players. Like we have many Latinos that I played with and many Asians. So I never really got to really witness any of that racial stuff. But you um, had a UN, huh? What was that? I said you had a United Nations. Mm-hmm. Right. No, seriously, we did. We had Hawaiian players. One of my best friends is Hawaiian. Got Samoan people I played with. Like we had everything. So we we're all just one. You know, it was nice and peaceful. But um I was was one of very few black people. But the one before me, the the one who made it out, the one who made it to the league was Aaron Hicks. And you know, he's a have breed just like me so he gave me hope that I can make it out and actually make it to the league and you know people are comparing me to him so it kind of gave me that hunger to you know I could be better than him you know I could be I could be that guy so he's the hell thankfully, I never really had to deal with that racial stuff and you know came from a blessed place man Freeport Long Island what was it like yeah uh, it was a lot like JP and, and SoCal um, very laid back, but I never really dealt with, with racist stuff per se, but I, I got to see privilege very early, at a very, very early age. Um, just from the way my, my white teammates would talk to their parents, a lot of times they'd say some things and I'd flinch for them because I'm ready for something to happen. Um, and then, you know, going, going to boarding school too, I had a unique experience because that was the first time I got to be around some white kids with money. And then see what real privilege was like, and Mercedes at eighteen years old, that kind of stuff. Like, man, Range Rovers, Audis, Mercedes, mommy and daddy's credit card, buying Gucci, Prada, everything, everything, man, it was crazy. And just to see some of the stuff that those kids would get away with at school, that 
we had maybe five black kids and there was they get kicked out for for cheating on a paper but the dude selling drugs down the hall he just got a, a probation and oh. had to go to detention for the week so just to just to see that and um the privilege early but baseball wise now i never really had to to deal with anything racially um i was very thankful for that but my dad was also real hard on me and told me that i had to be better as an African-American, 10 times better to get anything in life and in a society. So a lot of it was just me working by myself, didn't really hang out too much with anybody and just trying to get better. Sounds like we all had that talk at some point or another. Devin, what about you? Devin? Yeah, I was pretty much the only black kid on every team I ever played on. Um, I think the first time I had a black teammate was in eighth grade and that was just for one year. Uh, had a black coach. My summer coach in high school was black. So, like, me and him actually got, like, super close. We still talk all the time to this day. Um, he was a great mentor for me. And, like, he was just, like, like they were saying before, he knows how to – he knew how to communicate with me and, like, how to get the best out of me. Right. Which isn't always the case. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't the most – the easiest thing, but uh, – I mean, you just adapt, you know. If you want to play the game, you got to adapt. Yeah, well, I totally, I mean, yeah, my story's not all that dissimilar. I mean, I've always been the only black reporter broadcast almost everywhere I've been. So I, I totally relate to what you're talking about. Uh, and, and Taiwan, what about you? You, were, you, grew up, you grew up in Southern California as well, right? Yeah, <clears throat> where I grew up, um, you know, half the school was white, half the school was Mexican. There's probably maybe 10 black people in the school. Um, I was the only baseball player. I played basketball. There's a couple of black guys playing basketball. But, um, yeah, for my high school team, I was the only black player all four years when I played there. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where I didn't even pay attention to any type of racism or anything, you know, um, just where I grew up. And, you know, now when I look back at it, the place I, where I grew up, you know, there was a, there's a restaurant in my town called Copper Kettle Cafe, spelled with all K's, you know, and yeah, and now, you know, I, you know, when there was protests, there was, you know, hundreds of people with guns talking about any Black Lives Matter protesters come out, they're going to be shot on site, you know, I'm like, damn, I grew up here. That could have been me, you know, and I had no clue. I was just, you know, I just focused on, you know, my family, my sports. And now just looking back on it, you know, it's, it's, it's scary. Um, but, you know, it's just, this is where I grew up. And, um, you know, I haven't been back in a while. And now it's just like, man, like, a place where I grew up, like, I don't even feel like I want to go back there, you know. Um, you have a son, and, and, and if you and put this question to everybody, if, if, you know, if you guys if you have kids, if you have sons, if you eventually do have sons, would you – would you uh, point them in the direction of playing baseball, given what you've seen and heard and the, the lives yeah. that you've led to this point? Uh, I'm going to let – go ahead, Ty. No, I'm just – you know, I – the way I've been raising my son, you know, I just I just kind of let him do his own thing. You know, I, I don't – I don't want to – him growing up saying, hey, you got to play baseball, you got to play basketball, you got to do this. You know, whatever field or profession he wants to get in, uh that's up to him and but you know we will have a conversation um and you know my my son is black but he's also you know vietnamese chinese mexican so he's very very light-skinned very light i mean he doesn't even look black honestly he has black hair but you know so you know it's 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 sad and bad to say but you know fortunate for him the color of his skin and being black like he might get away with it, you know, and it's, it, it breaks my heart to say that, but, you know, he, he might not have to worry about the stuff that we're going through right now, just because yeah. of the color of his skin, even though he is black and does have black in him, but the color of his skin right now, you know. Yeah, I understand. Totally understand. Totally understand. Anybody else? Uh, like Ty said, whenever, especially I'm a second generation big leader and, you know, I'm definitely not going to make my kids, have to play baseball. I think the fight that we're putting up now should hopefully open some more doors for their children of the future to not just have to be an elite athlete 
or something like that, but to be able to thrive being something just as common as anyone else. Hey, um, I got uh, running short on time here. Let me, let me ask you this. Shed, you made, made a, a very interesting point, point about uh, having a dialogue with, uh, with, Af with um, the police officers. If you, you know, if let's say, you know, with the Mariners, we, we have an opportunity and, and you guys get to sit down. I know we talked about this in a previous forum that we did. Uh, to sit down in a room or sitting around having a couple of cup of coffee or something. What kind of stuff would you, in light of what we've seen and what we're, you know, shooting the other day, what kind of stuff, what kind of conversation do you want to have or what kind of thing do you want to say to a police officer? The guys who are walking the beat. They, they got to be better leaders. Um, you know, I mean, their, their job is to serve and protect our community. You know, so, so if you're going to serve and protect the community, you have to be the leader of the community. You know what I mean? If, if you got, you're the person that has to enforce the law, you have to be the leader of the community. But you got to lead it in the right way. You know what I mean? So, you know, it, it, can't be, it can't be having hate in your heart towards one person and not towards another. You know, it's got to be everybody's equal and, and you have to lead in the right way. I would say to, to, to that point, too, is, you know, you see, uh, you see a lot of people saying, uh, you know, not all, not all cops are bad. You know, 99% of the cops are good cops or 98% of the cops are good cops. And my question to them is, if there's 98% good cops, how come those 98% aren't standing up against that 2%? It's 98, it, it's, it's 98%. You should win that. You, you should win that every time. How come that 98% aren't going to ain't stand up to that 2%? So don't, so when people say that to me, it's like, it, is that is that true? Is it really 98% of good cops, you know? Like, cause if it was, then those 2% of bad cops would already been out. Yeah. You know? Especially now with everything going on. Well, but it's, it's, it's not. That really, that hacks me is, you know, like the other night in Kenosha, the guy's there trying to break up a fight. You know, he doesn't, you know, the cops command him to do something. He's getting in his car. And they shoot him in the back. Meanwhile, a dude who shot up the you know, people at South Carolina Church a few years ago, they take that full uh -huh. and freaking Burger King. Are you hungry? Yeah. Yep. And what kind of BS is that? Well, last night they gave the kid who shot people, they were talking to him in armored vehicles. They was thanking him. Gave him water. Yeah. Damn. Damn. You wonder why we get pissed off. Right. How about the other dude that got in his car and didn't get one shot? He caught a taser. Go to the car at the cop. Still didn't catch a shot at him. Yeah. And he was a white guy. White guy. Mm -hmm. But a black like guy. These, like these, these, these people killing these mass murderers. Like, how are they taking the jail peacefully? <laughs> but the first yeah. thing we hear when a black dude get killed is, Honestly. but he had a woman. Yeah, but it's so crazy too because, you know, it it goes to the point to where you know. Police, the police officer shouldn't be the judge and executioner, you know? Mm -hmm. So if, if, if a mass murderer is getting taken away peacefully, then everyone should be taken away peacefully. It's, it's three against one, you know, with, with Jacob. You know what I'm saying? You tell me three cops to one right? guy can, can't detain him and say, you know, and, 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 and do what you got to do, but it has to be shot seven times. But a, a, a dude can get to walk and kill seven plus people. And, and it's, oh, it's, it's all fine. Guns drawn, too, at, at the kid, you know, but that's fine. Like, it, it, they pick and choose, and it's just... All right. I just got a, pissed off. I got a video sent to me on Instagram not too long ago about a black guy shooting at two police officers at a traffic stop. And it clearly said, this is why they shoot us first. Because of one video of one black guy shooting the police officers. First of all, that's not right at all. Not by any means. But can just like they say, can you blame them for what's going on? Wow. Anybody, let's do final thoughts. Let's go around the room. Devin, uh, give me your final thoughts on, on this whole thing, man. Uh, maybe something on the wish list or, or something. Hey, if you want to condemn somebody, go do it or you know, whatever it is that you, know, you want to say. Speak up. Um, I want to see more training um takes more hours training to be a barber than it does to be a police officer wow 
And I'd like to see more restraint when you're dealing with the black community because you don't see it at all. Well said. Justice? Uh, I'd just like to see more action. Um, you know, things like happen, the, the things that happen today, you know, us not playing the games. Um, I'd like to see more action um, because obviously talking about it is uh, not getting the job done. Yeah. JP, what about you? Um, I think we need a new form of security because, you know, police came from slave runaways and it's the same system. So, I mean, I don't think nothing's going to change unless the system changes. Jed? Um, you know, I just want equal opportunity. That's all, you know, be treated, be treated the same way as everyone else and, you know, be protected the same way as everyone else. I hear you. I hear you. Amen to that. Kyle. Kyle. Yeah, same, man. Same. Just give us that same level of respect. It was that same level of respect. We ain't out here trying to hurt nobody, man. We out here trying to live. Everybody trying to live, man. Black lives matter, yeah. man. Yeah. yeah, we need that. JD. Same. Yeah, same as them. Uh, I just want to be treated equal, get the same opportunity, and, and not have to live my life in fear. That's yeah. the biggest thing. Yeah, I hear that. D? Like they said, just equal opportunity, not living in fear, and watching us thrive as a people. Amen. Amen. Hey, look forward to seeing you guys at the yard, man. Uh, we got to get together next time in a lot better circumstances than this. This is the second time we've had to do this in a few months. Evan, look forward to meeting you down the road, man. Good luck the rest of the way.